Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield back on Broadway in New York talking to a man I've been asking to meet for many, many years. <laughs> He's really the star of Broadway who through his entire life has written some of the most magical, memorable and wonderful pieces of music that we love in musical theatre. Currently with Wicked and Working and many other shows around the world. Stephen Schwartz, how are you? I'm great. Really great to talk to you, Alex. Thanks yeah. for this. What is it like being you? I wonder as we sit here in your New York apartment to think that just a couple of blocks that way several thousand people every night and twice on a Wednesday and Saturday enjoy your work as they do around the world on tour and it's from your head your creation it's a good feeling you know I've I've hung around a long time now I think there was this actress uh, American actress whom your audience may not have heard of because it was a long time ago named Helen Hayes and people asked her about you know her success when she was quite old and she said you just have to hang around long enough and and I do feel that that's been a bit of the case for me you know and now I've finally gotten to the point where I hear from different people about uh, a show or a song that has been meaningful to them or helpful to them, whether it's something from Wicked or the other night I went to the theater and for some reason it seemed to be Children of Eden night in the theater. Three or four people came up and talked to me about Children of Eden. Um, and since, you know, in the end what we are doing as writers is an attempt at communication, when you get um, evidence that you've communicated with someone, then that's obviously a gratifying feeling. It's interesting you mentioned Children of Eden. I think that was the first show I ever saw in whatever time we have is a song that I think is probably, if not your best song ever, it's certainly one of them. It's a beautiful song. And that show, like Wicked, has such heart. Again, is picking your favorite show like asking what your favorite kid is? It's an impossible question. It is. I mean, the truth is I have a soft spot for Children of Eden for many reasons. Um, I do think it's my best score personally. And... I think that it's the, my most personal show in terms of what it's about and its themes. Um, so I do, have, as I say, have a soft spot for that. But of course, you know, particularly in the later stages of my career, I wouldn't be doing something if I didn't care about it. How hard is it when you've written a piece of gold and somebody takes it and turns it into something that you didn't necessarily want it to be and it doesn't become the hit that it deserves to be? That must be as frustrating as the glory of something like Wicked, which is flying around the world. First of all, you know, theater is a collaborative medium. And so that's just part of it. Sometimes the collaborations gel and sometimes they don't. Um, in spite of everybody's best efforts. I mean, nobody gets together in a collaboration and says, let's do a show that doesn't work. You know, everybody's trying his or her best to do something that works, and sometimes it just doesn't come together. You know, I've been, I feel especially fortunate in my life to have been given second and even third chances with shows which didn't work initially. I mean, you cited working, which is playing in, uh, London right now in a brief uh, limited run and that was a show that failed on Broadway initially but then has gone on you know 40 years later to continue to have over the years um, a very happy life and part of that is because that's the thing about live theater it's not frozen on film it's not frozen on a disc um, as long as you're alive as a writer you can go back and, and fix things that didn't work or change things that you've learned about that would make the show better. And I've had the opportunity to do that with, with several shows. I notice now there seems to be a theme in the last five or 10 years that if you don't get a Tony nomination and you open that season, you're probably gonna close because the costs are so high to get a show and have a hit. Well, I would actually challenge that assertion and I would, although these are not brand new shows, I would simply mention Mamma Mia and Beauty and the Beast um, as two shows which did very nicely, thank you very much, without a Tony nomination, or in the case of Beauty and the Beast, I think one for costumes. Um, that being said, I am not a fan of the Tony Awards. I think they're extremely destructive to Broadway and to the theater as a, as an art form or whatever you want to call it. Um, 
I feel it's a real example of the tail wagging the dog and has gotten worse and worse every year. Um, that being said, I recognize their value as a promotional tool for theater to some extent, mostly musical theater and mostly the one show that happens to win best musical that year. But I think the emphasis on them is a disaster and um, that you have some good shows that fall by the wayside um, and some not very good shows that benefit for a little while, at least, from Tony nominations. But in the end, if you look at what shows run um, and what shows don't, they seem to, if they can get through the early period, they seem to transcend um, the Tony period. I mean, I saw Waitress last night um, because I wanted to see Sarah Bareilles in it, who was astoundingly great, actually, and a much, much better actress than I anticipated, since I already knew she was a great singer, but I, I didn't realize what a great actress she was going to be. But the point being that I'm not I guess that show got some Tony nominations, but to my knowledge, it didn't win very much. But there it was in a sold house with people standing and screaming. So, you know, I think I think in the end that takes over. And is that the same theory across the pond with the Olivier's that actually that they're not helpful to the bigger picture of musical theatre? I have to tell you the truth. I know nothing about the Olivier's. I mean, every now and then something comes over here and it will say <laughs> Olivier Award winner. But I have no idea how they're given out, who gives them out, who's, who makes those decisions. Um, they've seen, you know, I just I never know what's won and what hasn't, except for if something comes over here and, and it says Olivier Award winner. And sometimes I think that it's peculiar that a particular thing has won. And mm. so I, I just don't know anything about them. We'll move on from that. Let's talk about you, because what a life you've created. And as we sit here today, I want to talk about the child in you at that piano. Were you always sort of musical? Did you always have these tunes coming in your head? Or at what point did you realize you'd got a gift? No, I was always a musical kid. Um, music, as you know, is genetically inherited, or the, the music gene, which is why there are so many musical prodigies. It's just um, a, um, a skill or whatever, an inherited skill that presents pretty early. And, um, and that happened in my case. Um, Neither of my parents are in any way musicians, um, but I think, you know, their parents or grandparents or whatever it came from somewhere. Um, but I was told as a, um, you know, just as a kid in my crib or whatever that I used to like to um, hear music. And I guess I, there was an opera recording my uh, parents have told me that I liked where it was a soprano singing selections. And um, I used to call it the high lady. Uh, apparently, and so I like to hear that. Um, and then my parents were theater goers, and I grew up fairly proximate to New York City in the suburbs. And so my parents took me to um, musical theater from the point when I was pretty young, and I was smitten by it um, right away. And so knew maybe from age you know seven or eight that my um, ambition was to write for musical theater. And for anybody listening to this who wants to be you, how do you then turn that into a career? Because we might all be geniuses in our bedroom, but then ending up with a product like Children of Eden or Pippin or Wicked, of course. How do you get there? Is it just slogging away? How did you get your first break? I think it is slogging away, frankly. I think you have to do writing. You can't just be a writer. You actually have to write something. And I think, though one has quite an inflated opinion of one's own work early on, um, you have to not get discouraged when you find out it really wasn't as good as you thought it was and keep plugging away at it. You know, I went to a drama school um, and at that school, I had the opportunity to write um, or co-write an original musical the four years I was at the school. Um, and the act of writing an original musical from scratch, even though uh, none of them were very good, the one of them ultimately evolved into Pippin, but all of them were pretty terrible at school. Nevertheless, I, I learned a lot about it. Um, we have a, 
uh, a composer lyricist t team right now who are having an enormous success on Broadway with a show called Dear Evan Hansen, um, Benj Pasek and um, Justin Paul, who are friends of mine. And I first met them when they were at University of Michigan because they were writing shows there and got in touch with me and said, you know, would you listen to what we've done and um, give us your opinion, et cetera. The point being that you know, they just started early and kept plugging away, and they had talent, but more than talent, or in addition to talent, I should say, they had perseverance. I think Wicked is the perfect musical for many reasons, and we won't waste time going into that, but musically, it is delicious. Visually, it's spectacular. And then the stars that you've created from it delivered the show that makes your work shine. Is it the perfect musical from your perspective? If you could change this note here or that song there, one of the things that fascinates me about artists is they're never quite done. They always want to keep tweaking and it's knowing when to stop, isn't it? That's absolutely true. Knowing when to stop is important. You know, I feel that Wicked is finished, that the show is the show. But I will say that the show was a big, big hit in New York um, for about a year and a half before we did the London production. And because the entire creative team was assembled again for the London production, we changed uh, quite a good deal of things for the London production that we had not been satisfied with. And then when they seemed to work better, we backfitted them into the Broadway production and the tours that were out. Um, but I think with that, we uh, the show is finished. I don't think it's perfect, and there are scenes that I sit, you know, when I when I attend it, and I hear the audience get a little restless here and there, or there are a couple of coughs come in the place they always come, or there are a couple. Of, I'm certainly not going to say what those are. Um, <laughs> and there are and there are scenes where I look at, and they're problematic. You know, some nights if everything fires exactly right, the scenes will work. But there are some nights where the scene just doesn't quite work, and that's probably because it's not a fully bulletproof scene. So I don't think it's uh, it, it's a perfect musical, but I think it's it's as good as this team is going to be able to get this particular material. I will say that we're, Winnie Holtzman, the uh, my collaborator and uh, the book writer of the show, and I are just in the process of. Um, working on the screenplay for the movie version. And it has really been both enormously fun, but also exhilarating to revisit how we tell the story and not just to, we hope, improve it in terms of making it cinematic, but there are actually some storytelling things that in retrospect we think, oh, we could have done this a whole other way and maybe this will be better. I think if anything is written on your tombstone, it should be that you've engaged more young people with live theatre than any other producer, writer, composer in history. What that show does with young people is extraordinary. I've never seen lines outside stage doors like Wicked. Young people love it, especially young girls. You've given them a voice, haven't you, in that show, which is so rare and so important. Well, it's, it's about young people. You know, it's about um, essentially kids and especially two young women who have big choices to make and who in their relationship uh, change each other and it also of course has its, at, at its center a character who feels herself an outcast and an outsider who desperately wants to fit in um, and of course that is a fairly common teenage feeling or a young person's feeling and then comes face to face with how much of myself am I willing to give up, how much of my soul am I willing to compromise in order to fit in and I think that is exactly something that people you know at that age struggle with. And again, you've launched so many careers on the back of that, whether it's Adina or Kerry in London, Defying Gravity. As songs go, it doesn't get any bigger. I mean, that crescendo doesn't get any louder, does it? Well, I do. I will say, with the risk of sounding arrogant, that I feel the end of the first act of Wicked is pretty close to a perfect moment in musical theatre. And it's not just that the song um, seems to work so well, Defying Gravity. Um, but yes, we get performers who do it brilliantly. But I think Joe Montello staged it brilliantly. The lighting 
um, frankly, by Kenny Posner is, I think, the best single moment of lighting or scene of lighting I've ever seen in the musical theater and so on. It's just everything sort of fires on all cylinders. Um, so it's a moment we're all pretty proud of. And finally on Wicked, I love the fact when you take it on tour, you don't shortchange your audience. I think the British tour is actually better than London because it's more intimate. The sound system is extraordinary. You can hear every note of that orchestra and the people on stage, which is rare. And the set and the costumes, you must spend a fortune on it. There's no cutting back for you to make more money, is there? It's not my money. <laughs> I don't. I don't spend the money on the set and the costumes. That's the. That's the producer's decision. But I will say that from the get go, um, our production team was determined to deliver the best show they could, and it wasn't really no expense be spared in the sort of uh, uh, be uh, in the sort of. You know, Spider-Man, where you just throw a lot of money at something. Um, obviously, I think they made intelligent decisions, but um, they certainly were not pecuniary about the choices that they made. And I respect that. I mean, there's even to the fact that when we were out of town in San Francisco with the show before we were going to um, come to Broadway, part of the deal was that they would close the show down for three months between the end of our out-of-town tryout and the beginning of rehearsals for New York to allow us, um, Winnie and myself and Joe Montello, to work on the show and um, try to execute the changes and improvements that we felt would be necessary after the out-of-town tryout. That was a very expensive decision that cost the producers about a million dollars simply to hold everything in place until we were ready to go back into rehearsal. Um, and more than anything, I'm grateful to them for that because I feel it turned out to be a million dollars well spent, but it might not have been. When the songs are parodied with things like Book of Mormon, is that thrilling for you or is it technically stealing? No, I love every <laughs> single time there is a parody and there are a lot of them out there now in plays and musicals. And we were on, you know, we were on South Park. I was a character on South Park. <laughs> There's nothing better than than being the subject of a parody. That's when you really feel you've made it. And those riffs when you hear them in Book of Mormon, especially, I mean, it. It is wicked, let's face it. They're not even denying that, are they? No, it's deliberate. That's, that's the joke. They're doing it on purpose. No, I love it. I think it's, it's, it's very, obviously it's very flattering. You know, when you, when you go into the, the culture to the extent that um, you're now part of the, the popular cultural parlance and therefore people can make fun of you, that's, that's a great place to be. Have you written your best song yet? Oh, I don't know that I would make that determination. Um, I feel as if I've learned a great deal over the years and, um, and that I have some more um, craft maybe at my disposal than I used to. On the other hand, there's a kind of rush of inspiration that happens when one is younger that you just are never going to get back again. So I don't know, you know, I just keep writing because there are stories that I want to tell and characters that I'm intrigued by and compelled by and um, things I want to say. So I keep writing songs and I'll leave it to others to determine, you know, what's my best or what songs are good or aren't. When I was a little boy, I learned to play the piano badly and I continue to play the piano badly, but it's still a best friend when something goes wrong. Is that thing the place you go to in tough times, whether it be family, whether it be health, whether it be show business, is that still your moment of relief? Yes, I totally agree with you about that. It's extremely comforting to, uh, to play the piano and sort of be immersed in music, not just sonically, but the physical act of playing the piano engages you so much physically. Um, yeah, I, I totally feel that way. And when you go in a theater, I don't know how often you revisit something like Wicked now and you hear a wrong note, are you about to punch someone or do you just take it in your stride? Because that's your music, isn't it? Well, it's pretty unusual given the level of professionalism in the UK or on Broadway to hear a wrong note. That being said, um, 
the rule of entropy always applies to live theater. That's the bad part about live theater. <laughs> the good part is you can always change it. The bad part is it's always in some way deteriorating, and therefore you have to continually, you and your team have to continually try and get it back by taking notes, by um, having rehearsals, by brushing things up, by you know bringing the sound team in and listening to things again. Um, the maintenance is a, a significant amount of effort, but that comes with the territory. So, I mean, every single time I go to the show and I go, um, I try to go every time there's a new cast, um, I inevitably wind up with a lot of notes that I then pass along to stage management or to the crew and um, you know and we try to address them and I'm not the only one doing that with the show obviously and I don't know about you but the respect I have for these guys both here on Broadway and in the West End to knock that out eight times a week and make it look so fresh like they want to be there when their entire day's gone wrong it's pouring with rain they're wet through and they switch it on I mean it's an incredible gift to be able to do that especially those who stay for months on end years on end absolutely um, yeah, that's that's challenging, um, but it's something, at least at Wicked, and, and I know several other shows, we take very seriously and frequently remind ourselves and the cast that the audience is seeing it for the first time and they've paid the same amount of money to see it that someone paid, you know, two months after we opened. And our responsibility is to deliver for them the best possible show we can. And if someone has gotten to the point in their um, stay with the show where they no longer feel as if they can do that, then it's time for them to go. Yeah. And actually, frequently, we'll have people who have done the show for a while and then they take a break. And, you know, management will go to them and say, we think it's time. You, you need a little time away from the show. Um, you know, let's let's revisit this six months from now, a year from now, um, you know, and maybe come back afresh. But uh, time to time to take a little break here. I hope you know how much joy you brought to so many people. That soundtrack must be on so many iPods that little girls across the world listen to day in and day out. And to bring that joy through that show and your many others, we can't pick as entertainers what the public like. They will decide. And certainly with something like Wicked, that joy that it just gives. And you see it at the stage door, the, the fun you've brought into people's lives, the, the consolation as well that their lives might not be perfect, but they can relate to somebody else who's equally struggling. I mean, for example, she's green, I'm ginger. It's the same sort of thing, really. You're an outcast. Cast, aren't you? Do you know what I mean? I totally know what you mean, <laughs> though I'm not sure I would agree with you about the ginger part of it. In fact, I know some people who would consider that a great asset if you really want to know, and I could probably introduce you to some of them if you would like that. Um, Almost defying humanity, really, though, isn't it? Let's be honest. Stephen Schwartz, thank you so much for having me here. I wanted to do this for so many years because you are a rare gift to show business that you keep churning out this stuff that is so magnificent and beautiful. And from my perspective, when I first saw Children of Eden in that theater, which was so glorious, it was so unique and so mind-blowing. It's probably the reason I'm sat here today, so thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it, and it's been great to speak with you.